Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship services. We welcome all our members as well as visitors today. Your presence is inspiring as we're here to worship our Lord. Please fill out the attendance cards that are located directly in front of you and pass them to the outside aisle, members and visitors alike. It will be collected during services by our ushers so we may have a record of your attendance. There were several announcements, to, but to bring you up to date um, from the PowerPoint, David Huss is back in the hospital. He is quite weak and in critical condition. Hey, yes? David is in the hospice. He's in the hospice unit. He's in the hospice unit. Definitely in need of prayers. Jerry Burrell had his heart procedure last week and everything went well. He said he has one. <laughs> Judy, did you know that? We have activities uh, coming up this week honoring Dr. Fred Barnett for his service as an elder during this Wednesday night meal. If you would like to fill out a card um, for him, to him, pick one up in the lobby. Please return with a four by six picture of your family no later than next Sunday, July 24th. Any questions, please see David. Our Wednesday night meal this week will be catered by Golden Corral. We will have breakfast as the menu item. And if you plan to attend, please sign up in the lobby today. The cost is $4. Our summer series wraps up this week with John Dale on Wednesday night at 7. If you haven't heard John speak before, he's an excellent speaker. We will have a come and go wedding shower for Jesse Tapp and Anna Poole next Sunday in the Fellowship Hall, 1.30 to 2.30 is the time for this. They are registered at Amazon and Target. On Sunday, August 7th, following morning worship services, we will have a lunch meeting for those that have agreed to be mentors for the children's ministry and the youth group for the upcoming school year. Please make plans to attend as important information will be covered. See Josh and Emily if you, are, if you have any questions. Jackson and Caitlin Baker uh, we'll need some help this week moving. Um, please see them if you can, if you're uh, for the time. Um, Caitlin will be directing all the helpers. I have a couple cards that are needing to be read. It's a thank you card. Dear elders in the church family, thank you so much for your much needed outpouring of love and support. The memory uh, candle and donation to the building fund during the passing of my precious mom and Christian love, Marlena Buchanan and her, and her family. Anona, thank you. Your kindness means the world to us. This is for Berman and Geraldine Addison. Dear church family, we want to thank you for the beautiful flowers you sent for the passing of my brother, Vernon Addison. We also want to thank you for the prayers and thought for Geraldine's hospitalization. We love you all. That will complete the announcements for this morning. Uh, those privileged to lead us in services this morning, opening prayer, Billy Ray, a song leader, Leland Steely. Chad McPherson will do the Lord's Supper. Uh, Shane Boggess, the scripture reading. David Salisbury will be doing the sermon and closing prayer by Jackson Baker. 
That concludes all the announcements as we begin our services.
Can you pray with me, please? God, our Father, how great thy name. Thank you so much for this wonderful place we have to worship thee. Thank you for the wonderful things you've done for all of us. All of these families have benefited from being thy servant. Thank you so much. Please be with those that have been mentioned that are sick. Please be with David. Help him to get some strength back any way possible. Please be with the nurses and doctors that are caring for him. Thank you, God, for the beautiful day you've blessed us with. Help us all to realize that. Help us all to be better Christians and better family people. Please be with Gary, I mean David, as he preaches a lesson to us. Help him to bring us a lesson that we can take it with us in our everyday works of life. Be with Josh as he works with our kids. Help their families be strengthened. God, please be with our military men and women that are overseas and at home, protecting us, helping to do their duties the best they can and come back to their families in any way possible. Be with our leaders. Help us to some way to bring peace to the country and the world. But most of all, God, we want to thank you for Christ and that sacrifice that he made on that cross for our salvation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
If you would, go ahead and be preparing the contents of the Lord's Supper. If you haven't already gathered those, you can get those in the, in the back on your way in. In Luke 11, verses 37 through 40, we read, As Jesus was speaking, one of the Pharisees invited him home for a meal. So he went in and took his place at the table. His host was amazed to see that he sat down without first performing the hand-washing ceremony required by Jewish custom. Then the Lord said to him, You Pharisees are so quick to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and wickedness, fools. Didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? There are several concepts that we can draw on within those verses to direct our minds this morning. But for purposes this morning, I want you to focus on the simplest part of that verse, the fact that Jesus was having a meal. Throughout all the scriptures, we see Jesus constantly having meals with his people. We see many instances where Jesus was having meals that, with people that weren't necessarily considered his people. Even when Jesus talks about heaven, he describes it as a feast. This morning, together, we're going to take of the ultimate feast. We aren't just taking the Lord's Supper again. Every time we gather around this table, it should feel like the first time, because we're sitting at the table with Christ. So this morning, this, through this communion, we declare that he is our Lord and that we are submitting to his lordship. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather around your table. We're thankful for the time to reflect on Jesus and the pain, suffer, suffering, and agony that he suffered on our behalf. We pray that as we partake of this bread, we um, do it in a manner pleasing unto you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. pray together. Heavenly Father, as we partake of this cup, which is uh, which to us is symbolic of the blood that cleanses us of our sins, we pray that we can also take of this in a manner pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. haven't already there should be bags placed on the pew beside you that you can put the remaining contents in as a matter of convenience the elders also set aside this time for us to take up um, collections for the work of the church here to continue Um, there are several ways to do that you can drop those in the back you can give online or you can mail a check to the church Um, let's pray together Lord, we are extraordinarily blessed in our everyday lives, Father, and we know that as Christians we're called to be generous, um, we're called to be good stewards, and this morning as we're given the opportunity to give to further your work and your kingdom and the spreading of your gospel, we pray that we can do that in a, in a generous and um, selfless way. Lord, we pray for those that have the oversight of these funds, we pray that they'll be used responsibly, and we pray for the success of their works in um, allocating those funds. Thank you for all that you do for us. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.
Today's scripture reading comes from Hebrews 6, 17 through 19. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong cons consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, in which enters the presence behind the veil. Thank you, Shane. Thank you for being here today. It is so good to be together, to worship God together. I love starting out our Lord's Day this way. I hope you joined us for Bible class as well. We've had a, a good morning. I do want to make mention a couple of things. Uh, we, we talked about David Huss. David is in room 10 at the Lucy Smith King Hospice Center here. Uh, please continue to remember him and your prayers. This Wednesday night, we're going to be honoring Dr. Fred Barnett for his service. We're excited to do that. Uh, several of you have filled out a card and let us know uh, if you'd like to get anything included in the gift we're going to give him. Uh, a card or a picture, please get that to us today and join us Wednesday night. We're going to do that as part of the Wednesday night meal. So make sure to sign up for the Wednesday night meal to be part of that. Also wanted to tell you tonight we're going to kick off a new sermon series as well, Fighting the Good Fight. We're going to take a look at the times in Scripture when Jesus stood up for something, when he conflicted with folks. Overall, Jesus was a peaceful person. He came to bring peace. But then sometimes he said, think not that I came to bring peace. And so we'll take a look at that and learn a little bit about the fights that are worth fighting and what we need to look at in our own life. It's going to be a really good Bible study. I hope you'll join us for that. This morning we kick off a new sermon series on hope. Someone has said hope stands for hold on, pain ends. Hope is a, a confident expectation in the Bible. When we talk about the, the hope we have as Christians, our hope is not like saying, well, I just hope things might turn out okay. I hope it rains this week or I hope it doesn't rain this week or I hope, I don't know, but it sure would be nice if. That's how the world uses the word hope. But our hope is a firm belief. And I want you to hear this. Bible hope is a firm belief that life gets better, even if it doesn't happen in this lifetime. Bible hope looks toward the promises of God, and it depends on the future. It counts on, as a guarantee, a better future that we look forward to. We live in a world that's filled with hopelessness with folks who don't believe things are getting better, don't believe they're going to get better, and aren't sure there's anything better waiting for them after this life either. We live in a world that wrestles with hopelessness, and it even infects the church sometimes. And it's not uncommon for us to wrestle with those feelings of wondering, maybe this is as good as it gets. Maybe the glory days were a generation or two ago. Maybe things will never be any better than they are. But hope is vital for the Christian. When Paul talks about those great three virtues at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, he mentions faith and he mentions love and hope is right there with it. Now abide faith, hope, and love. He says the greatest of these is love because it lasts on into heaven. But for this life, every Christian needs faith, hope, and love. Christians are people of hope. As much as they are people of faith and love, they are people of hope. Christians are people who are filled with hope. This church is a place of hope. Hope is preached and practiced by God's people. It is vital to who we are. And so as we kick off this sermon series on hope, anchoring our soul in Jesus, I want you to know it's really everything is based on actually one half of one verse of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 6 and 19, the first half says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. The Bible is so powerful, God's word is so amazing, that, that just half of one verse gives us enough to think about and dwell upon and, and to look into our own hearts, to challenge our lives, that, that it is powerful enough. Hebrews says our hope is sure and steadfast. Calls it an anchor. And, and you know, you know what an anchor is for a boat. Uh, an anchor for a boat, it goes back well before the time of Christ. The earliest anchor was just a rock that they would tie a rope to. It would hold that boat. It kept it from drifting with the current. And in a storm, it kept it safe. 
Later on, anchors were made with a claw or a fluke, something that would dig into the bottom to, to hold on to the bottom of the riverbed or the sea to keep that boat where it needed to be. Anchors are simple in design, but they are powerful in function, and they have been a symbol of hope for Christians. From the earliest time, Hebrews says this hope that we have as believers is an anchor. It'll keep us from drifting along with current, from just going away, the wind blows. It also keeps us safe in storms. We are anchored in hope. But Hebrews 6 verse 19 doesn't just say we're anchored in hope, it says this hope. There's a specific hope we're talking about. This hope that we have as believers. And from early on, the church took the symbol of an anchor and used that as a symbol for hope. In fact, you can go back and look at uh, graves of Christians from the first century, within the first hundred years, and on their graves, they would have the symbol of an anchor right up there with the symbol of the cross. It was a symbol, especially during Roman persecution, of hope. Hope for something better. Hope that this life is not all there is. Hope that says we trust God's promises. And even in this life, if we face difficulty and persecution, even to the point of giving our life for our faith, we still have hope. It's sure and it's certain. It shows up in a lot of Christian hymns, including the one that Leland led right before the lesson where we say we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure. But Hebrews says it's this hope. What is it about this hope that's different from all the other hopes? What is it about this hope that anchors our soul? What hope is that? Well, to, do that, to see that, we're going to go back just a little bit. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to back up just a little bit from verse 19 to understand this hope that can, can anchor us, that's a symbol, but also keeps us from drifting and, and holds us safe in the storms of life. What is this hope? Well, verse 13 says, when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying, surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. It's a great promise that God made to Abraham. The writer of Hebrews is writing to Jewish Christians. They knew their Bible history, their Old Testament history. For most of us, if you grew up in church, you know your Bible history as well. You know how important Abraham is as the father of the faithful. And, and here the writer of Hebrews says this hope that we're going to talk about, it's all based on, on what we see all the way back in Genesis. When God made a promise to Abraham, and we see that our hope is based on the promises of God. God made this promise to Abraham, and he took an oath to keep it, no matter what. God said, here's what I will do. It's not, here's what I will do if. It's not, here's what I will do after. Here's what I will do when. He simply says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the sand on the seashore, the stars in the sky. I'm going to make you and your family be a blessing to all the families of the earth. This is what I will do. It was a promise. But as God made that promise to Abraham and he says, I'm going to bless you, and the writer of Hebrews quotes this, I'm going to bless you with blessings and I'm going to multiply multiplicity of blessings to you. God goes over and above. It's blessings on blessings. And he's not going to add blessings, he's going to multiply blessings. And he's not going to multiply them once, he's going to multiply them multiple times. That's really what, the, what, what God means there. I'm going to bless you with lots of blessings and then I'm going to multiply them and I'm going to do that a multiple of times. It's blessings with zeros on the end. It's a great promise. Any of us would love to have that promise directly from God. Abraham gets it. And yet when somebody promises us that much good stuff, I mean, when you get an email that says, Hey, I want you to know I have billions of dollars and I need your help handling them. Do you immediately respond to that email and say, oh, yes, here's my bank account information and here's my phone number and, and please let me help you with those billions. We look at it and say, that's too good to be true. In fact, before most of us ever see that email, our email program has already looked at it and said, this is junk. This is spam. This isn't real. This is too good to be true. So God shows up to Abraham and he says, I'm going to bless you with blessings, a multiplicity of multiple times. And there's a little piece of Abraham that said, 
That sounds too good to be true. And God knew that. He knew that that sounded too good to be true. So God did exactly what you're supposed to do when people doubt whether you're telling the truth or not. When you say something and people say, I don't know about that, God swore an oath. God said, I swear I'm telling the truth. Now, we still use oaths today. Not as much in our language of today, but people swear on all sorts of things. You know, it's in our language, in our idioms. You say, oh, I swear on a stack of Bibles. I swear on my mama's grave. And we say, you know what, I swear on Scout's honor. Whatever it is that says, I promise and I give something to affirm my word. When you step into a court of law and you give your testimony, you place your hand on the Bible and you raise your right hand and you say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. We understand that there's a time when we say, I'm going to call something to witness against me. If I'm lying, I call something to witness against me to promise you that I'm telling the truth. And we swear by something bigger than us. That's why when you step into a court of law, you know what happens if you don't tell the truth after you swear like that? The court finds you guilty of contempt or perjury. And so we we have a system built in that says there's an authority that enforces the oath you took. So God says, Abraham, I know this promise sounds too good to be true. I'll swear an oath to it. I give you my word. But there's a problem. Who has authority over God? Who can force God to do what he says he's going to do? There's nothing bigger than God. And so he said, Abraham, I swear by myself, by who I am, by my very nature, that I will keep this promise to you. So what do you do next if you're Abraham? Abraham is a person of faith. God says, I'm going to bless you beyond your wildest dreams, Abraham. Bless you with blessings, multiply, multiplicity of times, all this stuff. What do, what do you do if you're Abraham? You wait. You look around. In confident expectation, you say, God, I trust you. I believe you're going to do that. And so you wait for that blessings, those blessings to come down as the prayers go up, right? And so Abraham waited, and he waited patiently, and it took a while. It took a long while. But eventually there was Isaac, the son of promise, the child of laughter, the child who represented the joy of God keeping his promise. There was Isaac, but that wasn't all the promise. And so Abraham waited. In fact, Abraham waited longer than he lived. Abraham didn't live to see descendants as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Abraham didn't live to see his people, his descendants, possess the promised land, take over that land as their own. Abraham never saw it with his eyes, but readers in Hebrews, they knew it had all come true. They knew their Bible history. You and I, we're like them. We know the story. Every word of God's promise was true. For Abraham, he didn't see it happen, but by faith he knew it would. In hope, He looked toward that future. Even though it didn't happen in his lifetime, Abraham received those promises. By faith, Hebrews 11 would say, but here in Hebrews 6, it's in hope. And in hope, Abraham could say it's just as good as done. So much so, and the writer of Hebrews doesn't go here, but we know our Bible history just like those Jewish Christians would have. So much so that Abraham, in hope, saying this is just as good as done. I know this is one day going to be our home, our homeland. This will be our country. And Abraham bought a cemetery plot in Canaan because he said, I want to be buried at home. And so Abraham bought that cave of Machpelah. Why? Because in faith he knew one day this is all going to be home. One day this will be where our people live. And so in faith and because of my hope, I'm going to buy a funeral plot in Canaan. And Abraham was buried there before he saw the promises fulfilled. And Isaac was buried there before he saw all the promises fulfilled. And Jacob was buried there even before he saw all the promises fulfilled. Because in hope, they knew it was as good as done. So Abraham, what do you do? You you wait You wait in hope. And verse 15 of Hebrews 6 says, And so after he had patiently endured, 
He obtained the promise. Isaac was born. And yet he obtained even more than that because in hope he knew that all of God's promise was true. For men indeed swear the, by the greater and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. In Abraham's mind, there's no more arguing. God said it. He promised it. Abraham said, I believe it. It's done. I take God at his word. God had promised it. He swore an oath that he would do it. So Abraham, by faith, he believed all that. God knew that Abraham was a person of faith, so why do that? Why go to the extra trouble of taking an oath? Why say, I promise this and I swear by myself I'm going to do it? Why would God do all of that when Abraham was already going to take him at his word? Verse 17 says something absolutely amazing. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise. Who are the heirs of the promise? God's looking generations down the road. God, why did you do this? He said, I'm looking generations down the road, Abraham, way past you. Determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. The writer of Hebrews said God did that for us. The promise God made Abraham, it was for our benefit. In fact, the reason he made the promise was for our benefit. It shows his faithfulness. God said, I'm going on record. This is what I will do. And Abraham, I'm going to tell you, but I know you trust me. But I want it written down and recorded because I want my people to know this is what I plan to do. And he says this is for the heirs of the promise. When the letter of Hebrews was written, when the, when the book was written, those folks who read it first in the first century, they said, hey, this is us. We are the heirs of promise. God said in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And they said, that's us. By faith, you and I, we can say we're the heirs of that promise. Today, it's us. God gave Abraham a promise. He confirmed it with an oath, and he did it for us. In that, by two immutable, that means unchangeable things, two unchangeable witnesses that tell us God's promises are always true. God is all-powerful. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is unchangeable. He cannot lie. By his very nature, God can accomplish what he says he will do. He is dependable. But even more than that, he obligated himself. He didn't have to. God can do anything that power can do. And yet when he makes a promise and confirms it with an oath, he says, I will do that. He goes from I can to I will. And in those two immutable, unchangeable things, I know he has the ability. And when he says I will, now I know he has the desire to bless with blessings, to multiply with a multiplicity. God obligated himself, and history records that all the promises of God have come true. All the ones that God has already been able to fulfill are fulfilled. His word never fails. Those promises that he made to Abraham, they all came true. He had descendants more numerous than the sand on the seashore. It's impossible to count. In fact, I think it's interesting if you were to go and do a Google search or, or do some more formal research into those who try to estimate just how many Hebrews left Egypt. They can't figure out the number. They argue, oh, it's this big. No, it's much bigger. Well, it might not be that big. They don't know the number. God said, I will bless you with descendants too many to number. And even today, folks are still saying, I bet I can number it. And then they find out, no, I can't. We can't figure it out. God's promises came true. He had descendants more than the sand on the seashore. They did come back to that land. They did take the land of promise. It was their homeland. They did multiply to become a great nation. And in part of that, 
as the, the Israelites grew and multiplied, a family line continued until Joseph and Mary were born and came together. And the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and Jesus was born. All part of God's promise. And in Jesus, all the families of the earth are blessed. And so we have been abundantly shown today that God is faithful. We have these witnesses, this testimony that says God always keeps his promise. And the writer of Hebrews says that gives us some strong consolation. There's great peace, great hope that comes from that. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says it was God's will to not just show himself faithful, but to be excessive about it, to show us that he could be trusted beyond all degree of certainty. He wanted us to be absolutely certain of our hope. And we need that. You ever had somebody break a promise? Hey, I'll be there. I'll help you. You can count on me. And then they don't show up. Or maybe they said, I promise I won't ever tell. I won't ever go back. And they did. They let you down. You ever broken a promise? You ever had to be that one? I'm so sorry. Maybe something happened and you said, I, I can't do what I promised to do. Maybe nothing happened. You just forgot. Maybe you made a promise and you never really intended to keep it in the first place. We know about broken promises. We have received broken promises and we have made promises that we have then broken. We know about broken promises and that's why God goes out of his way to say, I don't break promises. I keep my promises he is a promise keeper. He is a promise keeper every single time. He is faithful, perfectly faithful. And the writer of Hebrews says that's a powerful thing for us. The greatest promise that God has ever made is in Jesus Christ. And when your hope is in Christ, you're anchored firmly to all the promises of an all-powerful, unchanging, let's use Hebrew's word, immutable God. Your hope is tied to that. When God says, I'm going to accept Jesus in your place. I'm going to give him what you deserve. And I'll give you what he earned. And we say, really? That doesn't seem fair. I'm not sure that that sounds too good to be true. Why would you treat me like Jesus? He was perfect. He was sinless. I'm certainly not that. Why would you let him pay the price for me? Why would, how would that work out? And God says, I promise this is how I will treat you. The gospel is too good to be true, but God is too faithful for it to be false. It is what he's promised. And that hope, that hope that says... My sins can be forgiven. That I can stand before God and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, when I know for a fact I wasn't always doing well. I wasn't always good. I wasn't always faithful. How could I ever hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, when that doesn't describe me? And he says, I'll give to you what Jesus earned. Because Jesus took what you deserved. That promise, man, that's an anchor. That holds me fast when currents begin to pull and tug and I think, well, maybe I should. Maybe I should compromise. Maybe I should step away. Maybe I should move just a little. Maybe I should moderate. And the currents of the world and the day begin to pull at me. That anchor that says, no, I'm never going to leave Christ holds me fast. And oh, when the storms come, when everything turns upside down, when it feels like, as the disciples said to Jesus one time, don't you know we are at this very moment, we are perishing, we're dying right now. We are moments away from losing everything, Jesus. When the storms hit and it feels like that, they turn to Jesus. Why? Because he's their anchor. Their hope was anchored in him. In Matthew chapter 14, a different storm is on the sea and the disciples don't have Jesus with them. 
but they're good fishermen. They know what to do, and they were rowing as hard as they could, and they were getting nowhere. And all through the night, they're working and working, and it's not working, and they're losing ground. And Jesus comes walking across the water, and Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out to you. And oh, what must have gone through Peter's heart and everybody else's when the figure that they thought might just be a ghost says, come. And Peter steps out onto the water and he walks to Jesus. Why could you do that, Peter? How in the world could you leave? I mean, the boat didn't offer much security, but it's better. I'd rather be in the boat than out of the boat, right? It's a storm out there. How did you walk to Jesus? And Peter said, I just looked at Jesus. He's my anchor. I said I'd rather be with Jesus out of the boat than be in the boat without him. And he walked to Jesus on the water in the middle of the storm right up until he took his eyes off Jesus and he looked at the storm instead of Jesus. And when he lost his anchor, he began to sink. And he knew what to do. Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus lifts him back up. Jesus rescues him. That's hope. That's hope that is an anchor in a world of turmoil and confusion, in a world of division, in a world that, that we struggle with all the things we don't know about. God is dependable. He is an anchor. So this week, I want you to take just a moment to think about where your anchor is. You see, an anchor only works when it digs into the bottom. It's got to dig into the bedrock, dig into the riverbed or the seabed, and then it holds you firm. So what are you anchored in? Take some time this week to think, what do, I, what do you put your hope in? What are you counting on? And if somebody's let you down that you trusted, if somebody has lied to you, if somebody broke the promises they made, if you've been misled or manipulated, if you find yourself anxious or depressed or fearful of people, let me tell you up front, you're not weak, you're not dumb, you're not gullible or naive, you're human. We were created to hope. We were designed to need hope. And so you're not weak or, or dumb or gullible, but maybe you put your hope in the wrong place. You need an anchor that's going to hold firm and hold fast. And, he, and if you find yourself dealing with the results of broken hope, you are exactly the kind of person that Jesus wants to give hope to. In Mark chapter 5, there's a woman who's been unclean for 12 years. 12 years, she's been an outcast. She didn't fit in at church. She didn't fit in anywhere else. Nobody wanted her. She was unclean by Jewish standards and unwelcome. But she knows if she can just touch Jesus, it'll all be okay. And in that story, she just touches, she just makes it to the hem of his garment. I mean, the, the idea seems to be that just her fingertips brush the very edge of his robe. And that's enough. He heals her completely, physically, spiritually, socially. He renews and restores her. And that's our hope. That's the Jesus we put our hope in. Maybe this morning you need to be saved. Maybe as we talk about hope and an anchor, you say, I need that in my life. And as we talk about Jesus is our anchor, you say, what if I don't have Jesus in my life? What if I'm not in Christ? What if I'm not saved? The good news of the gospel is yours today. The promises of God are as valid today as they were the day he made them. And this morning, you can become a Christian. You can put your hope in Jesus. You can repent of your sins and confess your faith in Jesus as the Son of God. You can proclaim that faith. I believe that Jesus is the only hope I've really got. And you can be baptized and have your sins washed away. And you can anchor your life in Jesus Christ. Maybe this morning it's time to do that. To be sure. To give yourself that sure and steadfast anchor. To make certain. Or maybe this morning what you need is what that woman in, Mark, in Mark's gospel needed. Just to come, come back to Jesus. 
to be renewed and restored, to be healed completely. Maybe this morning you say, I, I need the prayers of the church. I need to repent. Or maybe you just say, I need help. You're in exactly the right place. You're in a place of hope, surrounded by people who place their hope in Jesus Christ. This morning, if we can help you, won't you come right now as we stand and sing?
please bow. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for all you've given us. Thank you for this beautiful day you gave us outside too. Please be with everyone on the prayer list and all those who are sick and injured in this world. Please be with David and Josh as they prepare for this next week with lessons. Um, in Jesus' name, amen.